Hello, everyone. I'm Ted Oakley, managing partner here at Oxbow. And I am so delighted today to be able to interview Jay Hughes. I've written, I've read, I should say, everything that Jay has written uh, that I could find over the years, including articles, uh, all of his books. And while I've never shared them with everybody, uh, I was so excited to know that we would be able to talk to Jay today. But Jay, I want to welcome you to this interview. Well, it's my luck and good fortune uh, that you reached out to me. And so thank you. I feel very privileged. Um, we, uh, we're going to be discussing today uh, uh, some subjects, basically a subject about your children and your wealth. But it comes from this book, uh, The Cycle of the Gift, which I've read a few times. Uh, but the, your other books, um, you know, the, the family wealth and all of that, you're so knowledgeable on that. But I'm going to kick it straight off with you and just ask you, in this book, you speak about the spirit of the gift and the difference between that and the transfer of, of, a, of a gift, if you could elaborate on that. Well, Ted, I think I'm going to start with some ancient wisdom. Um, Aristotle, of all people, and most of us have heard of him, um, was writing back there in 400 B.C., and one of the things that he wrote in one of his great books is that he observed that very, very few people ever made a gift. And lots and lots of people made what they called gifts, but they were really essentially transfers. So I can't take any credit for this. All I can do is to say in the lineage of our world and the Western world, uh, a very wise man a long time ago said, exactly what it is we're going to be talking about today. And so what, what do I think he means? What do I mean? Lots and lots of times we send something out into the ether, into the atmosphere from ourselves that we've created to somebody else. And we send that into the ether and then we recognize, hmm, sometimes, I wonder how they'll receive it. That's a wonderful question to ask oneself, isn't it? Not what are we doing, but how will they receive it? And so what I said in Psycho the Gift and what I think Aristotle meant is that if you put spirit, love, L-O-V-E, -E, into what you're sending into the ether and someone will receive, it's a gift. Almost anything else, as soon as there are little tiny strings, sometimes really big strings, I think it's just a transfer. Now, let me ask you, do you find that a lot of really wealthy people just do the transfer? I'm very sorry to say that I agree with Aristotle. The number of gifts are very few. The number of transfers are hugely numerous. And I'll say one more thing here, just because it isn't just the initial gift, but suppose somebody creates a structure, puts some capital in it, could be a trust or whatever, and it keeps giving every month or every over a lifetime of somebody. Isn't every one of those either a transfer or a gift? Maybe, maybe the question never ends. That, and that's interesting because uh, so much of what we do are with people that have had what you call that meteor effect of a large amount of money at one time, because we do a lot with business owners that they've sold companies. And that's that meteor that comes in. And all of a sudden, uh, boom, we have all this money and we've got to decide what to do, children, et cetera. But let me ask you, uh, let's go on. When I ask you, you talk about the how giving and, and one of the questions we had is, are there any recommendations that you have on how to prepare children uh, to inherit the wealth? Well, first of all, I would say that from my years of experience, and my dad, uh, Ted, was my great teacher, and he did this work uh, for 50 years. We overlapped for 19, which was an incredible gift to me. What did we observe? We observed that most of the time, the person who's going to be the recipient of this meteor isn't well understood 
in the sense of who that person is, what their dreams are, what their capacity to receive something is. So an action occurs. I'm a, I'm regret to say very often when liquidity events are happening, somebody dies, all of a sudden something happens and it isn't very thoughtful. Th that question of is there spirit in the meteor gets lost in translation of time. And then that person walking along quietly down the road one day has a great reveal, what we call the great reveal. Somebody, a lawyer, you, Ted, somebody, a banker, somebody calls that young person off the road and says, oh, by the way, come over here. Well, what, why? I'm, I'm perfectly happy. Life is fine over here. No, no, come over here. You sit in my office for an hour. And by the way, uh, you don't have to work anymore in your lifetime. What? Yeah, no, I have to work. What? What did you just say? And, and by the way, not only don't you have to work, but you have all of these new opportunities. The person says, new opportunities? They feel like burdens. Well, yeah, you have to meet a lot of new people you haven't met. You don't, aren't really interested in meeting. Yeah, I, I, you included, whoever this is, was telling me the great reveal. I didn't want to meet you either, as it turns out. You seem like a nice man, but wasn't, I didn't choose to meet you, no. And by the way, I'm also sad to tell you, you can't get rid of this. You have it for the rest of your life. Huh? So the short answer to your question, that was a long answer, is Thinking about the impact, and I'm using that word of, as a meteor, not some lovely ESG idea of great investing. No, here comes the meteor. And what is this human being supposed to do with something that's a part of somebody else? Because that meteor isn't a stone. It's not just coming out of some false kind. No, it's actually coming from something another human being created. So it's part of him or her, isn't it? The, do the donor isn't just a donor, it's a human being who created something, ambition, aspiration. What's that recipient supposed to think? So without being prescriptive, because I don't think one can be prescriptive about the experience of the recipient, what truly matters is as the donor sends something out, as from themselves, a piece of themselves, into the ether, into that meteor, who is that person who will receive it? What is his or her condition? What is his or her capacity? And I can't tell you a, a hard answer. What I can say is that that thinking is what Aristotle meant makes a gift. That I really considered the nature and condition of the human being on whom I'm acting. That's the key. I was going to ask you, have you ever felt like there was a particular point in time that you would talk about, you know, you have children, you have significant wealth. Is there a point in time or, you know, age? Uh, what, what's been your experience or what's your thoughts on that point in time? Well, I've long advocated that parents who believe, or grandparents, both, that they are going to have this question of making a gift, begin to consider who that person is on whom they're acting almost from the day they're born, because that's, that's the way it's going to be. And, but very specifically, so I'm not just sounding thing, but I do think that thinking about it at four and five and 10 and 15 is important as starting to think about it at 16. I do think 16 is a very important age. Now, why do I say that? Well, almost always in the world we live in, Ted, at 18, things happen to you. Now, some of them are things we don't think very much. If we're a boy and we reach 18, we have to register for the draft. I just told my grandson that a few weeks ago, and he said, oh, no, Grandpa, the draft's over. There's no such thing. I said, no, I'm sorry to tell you, Uncle Sam wants you. 
you know, I don't want to go. <laughs> I said, oh, I'm sure you don't. But I said, but I thought it was a bit late. I thought, well, at 16, it probably would have helped him understand what's expected of him as 18. A lot of people think of 21 or 25. I think of 16. I think 16 is the point at which conversations can truthfully begin, and, and Ted, there's more method to madness than you might think. Um, I believe that 18 is an extraordinarily important time as we go off to college for young people to become responsible for their college expenses, tuition and as expenses. Now, not have that money necessarily, although lots of young people do have these trusts that could support that. But it's a great opportunity to learn how to budget, how to think about a meteor, and actually also to think about the gift of an education. Isn't it pretty easy with the families that you're imagining and that you're advising to just assume everybody goes to college? Just assume it's paid for. It's an enormous gift, and education is an extraordinary gift. It's maybe the most important gift you'll ever get in your life. So do you say give it to them or have them earn part of it? Both. Oh, Both. Okay. Okay. So what my parents did, which I thought made a lot of sense, my dad said, look, I'll pay your tuition, your room and board, but every other expense is yours. That was really useful. And he asked me, by the way, do you know what Princeton College cost? This is back in 1960. Nobody could imagine how in the even in inflate, uninflated dollars. It wasn't that large, but he said, I'll take care of that for you. But every other expense is yours. And I thought, well, that makes sense. I'm, I'm going off to be responsible for myself. I think I, that makes sense. So, so, you work. so you work. From the age of 15, I had a summer job every year. Yeah. And by the way, to really date myself and make everybody disbelieve, I collected pop bottles and newspapers and the other things that I could do in my, in, in, and I had a bike and a wagon. Sure. But the point is, what did I learn? I learned what money is worth. And I also learned that my father was making me an incredible gift. Would you agree? I, I totally agree because I, I wrote a, a small book, nothing like yours called rich kids, broke kids. And the number one thing I put in there was I said, you know, you have to put them to work and not just because they need to earn the money, but they need to understand when they, that they're, they can be self-sufficient, stand on their own feet. Uh, and that self-esteem part is what separates what I consider really rich, spoiled kids from kids that have money, but they've got, they've got it together. Uh, and Ted, I'm going to add one thing, and I bet it's in your book too. We suffer in America today that we do not know each other. We suffer hugely. One of my summer jobs was in a factory in Long Island City. I had to get up at five in the morning and drive there and go on the line from seven till three and, and join the union. I met the most interesting people almost of my lifetime. Now, I didn't go in the military because that wasn't happening, at but, but I did meet. Lots and lots of kinds of people. And so it isn't only the work. That's why I'm adding. This is the, the gift of summer jobs, in my view, is, yes, you learn about the value of money. You learn what it is to earn. And that's very important. But I don't think what we, we've often discussed, not you and I, but discussed as well as we might, what it means to get to know other people. I think that may be, was for me, the greatest learning. So true. So true. Let me ask you um, on, a, on a similar, same subject, but I'm sure you've been asked this many times in your career, but should you, if people ask you, should you give your children equal amounts or how do you feel about treating children differently? Obviously everybody's different, but how have you approached that with the people that you've had to counsel? Well, my dad and I discussed this a long, long time ago, and I found his advice very useful. So I followed it. And what was his advice? He said, Jay, it's very important during lifetime, he said, while well, he was alive, um, to act at the moment of opportunity. Not fair, equal, no, 
act at the moment of opportunity. So he created for our family, when my youngest sister graduated from college, he called me aside, Ted, and he said, Jay, your mother and I are now a bank. I said, what? You're a lawyer. What do you mean, you're a bank? I said, yeah, we're a bank. So he, and he said, it's very simple. Well, Ted, when my father said that, I was going to be there an hour or two, <laughs> which I was. What was he saying? He was saying, look, we, your mother and I have finished something that was very important to us, getting all of you through college. Now we have some extra resources. Not a lot. We were a lawyer's family, and he, he had made the money in, uh, in his lifetime. He said, but I would like you and your brother and sisters to become the board of a bank and act at opportunity for you and my grandchildren. I said, well, that's really interesting. And that really worked well. By the way, there's a chapter in one of my books on that, and it's also on my website. So Family Bank, that's a really, really useful idea. Not a venture capital. This was grants and loans, grants and loans at the moment of opportunity. It Did worked. You pay them back? Oh, sometimes, and sometimes they were grants. It depended, absolutely. Okay. But the point is that he said, look, Act at the moment of opportunity. And then he said the other thing. He said, when you die, equal. He said, don't leave anybody, no matter what their circumstances, feeling less cared about. That was the best advice I ever got. Act at opportunity during lifetime. And you more or less keep it equal if you want to. But the point is, act at the moment of opportunity. That's how capital has its greatest impact. And then at death, equal. Now, I'll make one exception. If a child has special needs, it still should be equal, but it should be done in a way that recognizes that that person has special needs. Or maybe even it isn't unequal because that person has special needs. And I've never had a family say in the generation that had a child with special needs that they didn't think that was a good idea, that that child was favored, if I could put it that way, because life had been disfavored. Right. And, and so in that respect, let's say you've had people with children and maybe one child they know is a spendthrift. They can't really handle money. Yep. And another child is really very good at handling money. And that's why this question always comes up is for, for these people with, with yep. significant wealth, how do I, you know, what, what are we going to do here? And I, I understand the equal part at death, mm. uh, but during the lifetime, uh, I suppose there's, you've given some counsel on that. Uh, I have, and I start from two different points and see where they merge. The first is that in our field, uh, a number of excellent psychologists have recognized that there are eight or nine different ways that human beings deal with resources, all the way from the spendthrift to the miser. Misers aren't good either. The, the biblical story of the talents gets right at that, doesn't it? <laughs> we got, we've got a great story there that's thousands of years old. So what I try to do is I try to help the parents and the grandparents figure out what the, what is the way that this person that they're going to act on, gift, not the transfer, how are they wired? Now, the interesting thing, that's the first side. So the psychological side, how are they wired? So the second direction that I come from, Ted, is aspiration. Let me say something to you and our wonderful uh, watchers that Far, far too little time is spent on aspiration. Far more time is spent on, well, we have to do this, we'll do it. And no, I think that's not the best way. If I know someone's aspiration, then I have a little light sense of what they will hold in their hearts and heads toward inspiration and then how they will exercise perspiration. So here's the spendthrift. Let's take the one we worry about. Now, I'm telling you a funny story about this. I usually don't get asked by grandfathers about spendthrifts. I say, Mr. when I explain about how money and gifts deal with aspiration and then inspiration and perspiration. 
and dreams, bringing dreams to life, which is aspiration. They will say to me, well, Mr. Hughes, you don't mean I should have a surfer grandson. I say, well, and they say, oh, no. Oh, no, you're not going to tell me I should have. I said, well, let me just ask you a question. Suppose the surfer grandson comes to you and says, Grandpa, I think I want to be a surfer. And you say, well, that's ridiculous. You're a spendthrift. That's, I toss you out. I said, hang, hang on a second. Suppose you said to that young man, well, what does that mean to you? And suppose the young man said, well, I want to win the gold medal at Waikiki. Really? Hmm. Well, what does that mean? It says, Grandpa, it means for the next five years, I get up at 5 a.m., I go in cold water in a wetsuit, and I find the best coach on the planet. And I get in the water every morning at 5 o'clock, and I try to learn to do that. Grandfather says, that's not fair. He's a spendthrift, but he, I, he said, Mr. Hughes, I'm paying you to tell me that. I said, yeah. And I said, have you considered it? That was my father's great question, by the way. And when somebody wasn't getting someplace, I, he'd say, have you considered? Oh, boy, that's a great, it's nasty, but it's a great question, isn't it? And so now the grandfather says, well, I see what you're saying. I have to ask about aspiration. Yes, don't assume. Don't assume. Assumptions are really risky. Rather, ask questions. What's your aspiration? What are you dreaming about? What's your aspiration? And some of the, I've, what I've found in my life, Ted, is if someone is holding an aspiration, it's not ephemeral. They're holding it. Very often that leads to inspiration. And now they're going to do something, and that leads to perspiration, and that leads to flourishing. And here's the funny thing about that odd thing. If the fair person who's made the fortune thinks back to their early 20s, thinks back to what was really going on, they discover they're holding and they held an aspiration longer because they were hold that was really important. Feel that? Then they got inspired. Then they perspired and they flourished, but they've forgotten that. You know, it's interesting, too, because if you think about how that plays out, uh, they may become uh, the largest surfboard manufacturer in the world. You bet. They, and, I mean, and you why never not? Know, right? <laughs> and, well, and why not? Exactly. But, if, but if, if we sort of cast that person into one little box, spendthrift, I'm not saying they're not spendthrifts. Please don't anybody hear that we, there are plenty of spendthrifts. But what... What's that person's aspiration? Isn't that an interesting question? And and I think when you're speaking about that, you know, I, I you know, we 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 look at these people that have you know a lot of wealth, and and we have a we have a we have a basically a how of giving from your book, but there's a there's a quote in there about how control. This goes back to this control thing about. Hey, I want to control you so that I'm going to, that's, that doesn't mean a lot to me. So I don't want it to mean a lot to you, but you have, we have a slide here that your quote, which is control contributes to great success in some areas of life, but it creates a lot of difficulties in others, which is along the same line you're speaking here, I think. Yes, it does. And there's a very thoughtful book. Um, that I read some years ago called Power and Love. And the author makes a wonderful point in that book. He says, ask yourself if you are thinking of power over or power to. And he said, you can avoid a lot of mistakes in your life. If you imagine power over as the only answer, rather than imagining power to as the almost always better answer. And, and then you get, yes, and then you get to love on the other side, but you see where, where it leads yes. And the other part about that is we have, we have, I mean, you know, we've seen this many times that after this meteor effect of all this wealth and, and liquidity, uh, 
that second generation becomes very, very resentful because they hold it over them. And, you know, what, what, what can I tell the, you know, the, the patriarch or the matriarch, Hey, you shouldn't do this, but I, I, they do it anyway. Well, they do. And that's okay. Uh, it's theirs. They're, they have to, yeah. uh, I shouldn't say they, but a person who has resources beyond what they basically need. And those resources are going to be uh, flooding into the world in different ways. Um, if you ask yourself the question you raise with me, power over or power to, and you ask yourself what is likely to be the outcome you can save yourself a lot of heartache and you can save yourself a lot of those errors not being resentful because you looked at the question the way you actually look at the question and everything else you do in your life. You're, you're, in, enabling, you're in an enabling position, if I could use it that way. So how are, you, what are you, how are you enabling and to what end are you enabling? Isn't that interesting? Very and I, I know one of the great thing about the cycle of the gift that you wrote is you, you break it down into the, the how of giving, the why of giving, the who of giving. But part of the who of giving that I have a, I have a question in that area is that is, and we have this question all the time, okay, which is how much is enough to give my children and grandchildren? Okay, how much is enough? Uh, and you write about guilt and remorse and, and the nothing too much which is an interesting topic in itself, but uh, you might talk about that. How much? Well, if we continue with, for a moment, the thought of aspiration and power too, you get a very interesting equation. If you ask yourself, well, I'm going to act on this person. I'm going to send them a meteor. Maybe it's alive, maybe I'm dead, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to happen. So what is their coming back to that aspiration? Who are they? What are they? Who in this lifetime are they? What are they aspiring to be and do? And then if I look at the resources power to do something toward that aspiration becoming an inspiration, I've got a really good equation. I'm not looking at it as numbers. I'm looking at it as in the context of that person, and I'll, I'll take it a little further. So, jumping a little bit, but I want, but I think it's very important. Lots and lots of the people that you helped, Ted, and that I've helped in my lifetime, and our colleagues, um, choose at death or during lifetime for money to go into trust. That's the American way. Okay, what are people thinking about when they create these trusts? Well, they're thinking first. I'm going to save some taxes. And then they're thinking, I'm going to avoid some creditors. My kids can be, make a mistake. And money, my, my money won't be taken because of their mistake. And then they think, gee, it's a monument to me. So three things. Now, when that trust is put in place, lifetime or death, it's done. All the purpose of that trust is fulfilled. Taxes have been saved. Creditors avoided. Monument made. Hmm. But now what happens? Human beings have to live in that trust. But they weren't under consideration. So by the way, no plan works after you die. No plan, because the people have to live in it, and they weren't thought about. So what do I do, and what do my colleagues do? Two things that I think I'd love our watchers to know. First, great trusts begin with two sentences. This trust is a gift of love. This trust exists to enhance the lives of its beneficiaries. Ah, now I just changed the trust. Now the beneficiary says, I live in it, but I look what my job is. My job is to discover this is love, not power, love, power to, love for. And look, the job is for me to be in my life to be enhanced. Oh. Well, I don't know how to do that. And the trustee says, neither do I. And all of a sudden, you have a dance, a beautiful ballroom dance, which the trustee and the beneficiary spend a lifetime figuring out. Oh, wow. Now that trust isn't dead on arrival. 
It had something else to do. And in doing that, I begin to get to the question of aspiration. Even if I don't know, I'm dead. I don't know what the aspiration is. But now the trustee has a duty to find out of each for, for each beneficiary, right? Because the trustee has to say, this is a gift of love. That's what it says. And the trustee says, and by the way, my job is to figure out how this trust enhances your life. So you've got to tell me that. Oh. Now, just to add to that, for those that are thinking about it, so what did I write in another book I wrote called Family Trusts with Keith Whitaker and Hartley Goldstone? What did we say in that book? We said in that book that every trust has to have a group of people helping the trustee help the beneficiary discover how to enhance his or her life. Not asking the trustee the impossible duty. I'm saying, have some people who get in the trust, who join the play after the trust is created, and their job is to mentor, be purposeful, be generative, help the dance be beautiful. I'll elaborate on that. Who, who, which people? You. So somebody comes and says, Ted, you helped me do this, but you're now a certain age. You have children. You, you've been a good parent. I, I don't know. I, I need some people in case I'm not here to help the beneficiary and the trustee with this dance, all positive. Yeah, you could help them with the investments, I have no doubt. But I really don't need that help. I wouldn't mind it. But what I really need is this other help. I, I really need the beneficiary to have an enhanced experience. Hmm. So you could help. Uh, by the way, ants. So they're ants, not trustees. They just care about the the, the beneficiary. They're not. They only have one trustee. Yes, and they help the trustee make great life enhancement ac actions. By the way, just I know people are thinking, what he must be talking about the distribution function. I never use that term. I want, I want to talk about life enhancement because otherwise the trust has no purpose or certainly it will lead to exactly the kind of trustafarians and what I call remittance addicted people. As I discovered when I started this work, I said, that's unacceptable. How can it be useful? I'm not making a speech here. How can it be useful for resources to lead to remittance addiction? It's just not useful. Forget the suffering and the sorrow of it. Go the other way. Take a different approach. And you know, with corporate, you know, with corporate trustees, it'd be interesting to me to see how many corporate trustees really had the ability to do that as well, because, you know, you've, you've seen this all your life, but it, there's this war that goes on between the trustee and the beneficiaries. All beneficiaries just want money. Corporate trustees say they're trying to cover themselves. So there's nothing pulling everybody together like you're talking about. Well, that that is a disaster and has been for years and years. But must should it continue? Now, that's a very good question. Should it continue? So suppose instead, I'm not, I'm just positing this, but I spent a lot of time thinking about it. Suppose the trustee understands that. 50%, this, this will really blow the watcher's mind. Ed. Suppose the, the person writing this trust says, okay, I want a trustee that's going to spend 50% of its time on life enhancement, 20% on administration, and 20% on investment. Now, people say, well, that's, that's, are you kidding? I said, no. And I said, I'm going to even make an economic argument to, to try to understand the trustee's work is administration is almost all outsourced. That's well, that's true. Yeah, that's, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and now let's turn to investment. It's all outsourced. In fact, the, the second, third law of trust uh, reformation requires it to be outsourced. Got to find an advisor, open architecture, wherever you want. So if you actually look at the situation, 
the trustee is overseeing administration and overseeing investment, but not doing it themselves. So how about spending 50% real time on life enhancement? Now, what do I mean by that? Well, if you and men like you and women like you were interested in the beneficiary having a positive experience, help the trustee create an environment between the trustee and the beneficiary, it happens, but it happens all the time. Now, by the way, I'll add this. Why have a lot of the wealthiest families in America created their own trust companies? Not in competition with commercial trust companies, no, but because they thought, and probably were right, that they could then create a system where life enhancement was 50% of the time of the trustee. Yeah, I'm going to wind up with a couple of things, but right. you're all in one together. And, and But, you know, you're talking about, you know, when we all know this term and you mention it in the book, Trust Babies and Trust Affair Ends. And, right. Uh, and I, I'd, I'd be curious your answer on this. But one last thing is that how, what percentage of uh, – what percentage of people do you think, I mean, we see quite a bit, I don't have a number, but we see a lot of uh, situations where the gifts have led to um, not only entitlement, de but dependency. So uh, we, we, we see quite a bit of that. And, and I'm always curious about what the person that was making the gift is thinking, because they're like, that, that's that, to me, burdens that person for life. Ted, um, at the risk of being a psychologist for a moment, which I, for which I have no degrees, uh, but having spent now 54 years observing human behavior in this particular tiny arena of human behavior, it isn't surprising to me how many trustafarians what I call remittance addicted people, there are. It's a tragedy. Now, what's going on? Well, I don't want to run on, but I'll be short here. Every time a meteor hits a person, and it's a transfer of any kind, so it's not a gift, coming back to where we started, it's got strings attached. It's a transfer. It's almost always power over, not power to taking themes we've discussed. What happens to that beneficiary who's walking down the road? Well, any psychologist in this field will tell you that they exhibit post-traumatic stress, pure and simple. Now, how does post-traumatic stress appear? Well, you have fight, flight, and freeze. These are the three forms of post-traumatic stress. Fight, flight, freeze. Fight, spend it. Spend it. That's fighting. Flee, give it away. Get rid of it. Freeze, which is the addicted situation, about 80% of the time, by the way. Who are the frozen? Nice people. Nice house. Nice car. Nice kids. Nice country club. Nothing going on. They are, they are not the ones who are being profligate, nor the ones who are giving it away. They're the 80% of actually post-traumatic stress victims. Now, the really interesting question for me is post-traumatic growth. And this isn't the place to get into that, except to say that the great work of the plan is to assume that there will be post-traumatic effect. And will that plan lead to post-traumatic growth? not assume that the person will just happily receive and be great, but rather say the, the meteor is going to have impact. What, is the, what are the possibilities that for a human being when something out of space has impact? And then what are the behaviors? And then where can you go? And where I'm speaking here is this. If the giver says, I'm going to make a real gift. I'm going to put spirit and love in those meteors. They've changed the possibility of the impact being stress to growth. If they don't think about that, 
then they must ask themselves a different question. And that is, shall I do it at all? Now, the interesting thing there that I challenge people, and I know we're coming to the end, but I'm going to say this. The answer is not give it to strangers, because you're probably going to do that worse. Philanthropy is not the answer. It's an answer to some questions. But giving to a stranger requires you to have even more intention than giving to somebody you know, because you don't know at all what's going to happen to them. That's why welfare creates dependence, pure and simple. So, uh, no, let's say we're going to act toward the people we love. We're going to act with love for, and we're going to act for power to, and we're going to act toward that person knowing that our action is going to have impact and that the impact has risk. And then saying, what can I do to get all the way to post-traumatic growth as fast as possible? And I would say that the key to that is helping with that beneficiary, that heir, whoever it may be, his or her aspirations in life. Well, you know what? That is a great place to wind this up. I, I, I have to tell you, uh, never more interesting conversation I've ever had with anybody uh, since I've been interviewing people. And I, I know people out there have their, this is on their radar. And Jay Hughes, you're such a fantastic person in this area. We, we have to have you back sometime in the future. There's a lot of things they that this is just one area of family wealth to transfer, but I, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to do this. Uh, we, we appreciate it. There'll be thousands of listeners that uh, watchers, I should say that will, that will see this. And so we really appreciate you being with us today. Well, this was an invitation I cherished. Yeah. Well, thanks Jay. And for all you out there, you'll see time to time during, you'll see where you can get, uh, copies of, and order copies of Jay's books. I would encourage you. They're fantastic. A lot of knowledge. And until the next time, I appreciate Jay being here and we'll see you the next time. Thanks.